This Aaron conference will now be recorded. I would like to welcome you to this public hearing. My name is Allison Jaden, and I'm a Special Projects Manager in the Air and Radiation Administration, Maryland Department of the Environment, MDE. I am serving as the hearing officer for today's hearing. The hearing is being recorded as well as transcribed. Today we have for the record as the court reporter, recorder, I also have Sam Furio, the Building Decarbonization Outreach Coordinator with MDE to assist in the hearing. This hearing concerns the proposed 2024 Maryland Building Energy Performance Standards, Code of Maryland Regulations 26.28 or COMAR 26.28, and the withdrawal of the proposed 2023 Building Energy Performance Standards. This action is required by the Climate Solutions Now Act of 2022. We will use the webinar login to record all of those in attendance today. Let the record show that the time is 1.05 p.m. on October the 9th, 2024. This hearing was scheduled for 1 p.m. start time. We will now proceed with the public hearing concerning the proposed regulation COMAR 26.28. The purpose of this hearing is to give you, the public, the opportunity to comment on the regulatory proposal. Notice of the virtual public hearing for this action appeared as follows. In the Maryland Register, Volume 51, Issue 18, pages 830 to 839, on September the 6th, 2024. On the Maryland Department of the Environment, Air and Radiation Administration's webpage, titled Air and Radiation Regulations, Public Hearings, Meetings, and Requests for Comments, and on the Maryland Department of the Environment's webpage titled Calendar of Events. The public comment, peri public comment period began on September the 6th, 2024, for receipt of all comments to the proposal. Oral comments are being recorded today, and written comments for the proposal must be received by 5 p.m. this evening, October 9th, 2024. Comments may be sent to the Maryland Department of the Environment, Air and Radiation Administration, Building Energy Performance Team at the email beps.mde at maryland.gov. We have a list of people who wish to make a statement today. If your name is not, is not on the list and you would like to be added, you may use the webinar chat feature to add your name to speak. I will check to see now if we have any participants that would like to make a statement today, but are not on the list. Sam, could you please confirm that we've added all the names from the chat into the list? Yes, we have added all the names from the chat into the list. We have 23 signed up to speak at this time. I want to check one more time. Do we have anybody on the phone or who is otherwise unable to add their name into the chat who would like to make a statement today? If so, please state and spell your name. Hearing none, the hearing will proceed in the following order. First, I will introduce Dr. Zach Berzola, the representative of the Air and Radiation Administration, who will make a statement. After Dr. Berzola is finished, I will call on any elected official or government official who wants to make a statement. Then we will call on the people who have signed up to make a statement in the order they appear on the screen. I will now call on Dr. Zach Berzola. Thank you, Allison. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zach Berzola. I'm the Building Decarbonization Section Head in the Climate Change Program of the Air and Radiation Administration, Department of the Environment. Notice of this hearing appeared in the Maryland Register on September 6, 2024. Access to the proposed action and supporting documents were made available by request or via the Maryland Department of the Environment Air and Radiation Administration webpage titled Air and Radiation Regulation Public Hearings, Meetings, and Requests for Comment from September 6, 2024 to October 9th, 2024. This public hearing is being held in conformance with the State Administrative Procedures Act, codified under the Annotated Code of Maryland State Government Article, beginning at section 10-101, and the Annotated Code of Maryland Environment Article, beginning at section 2-301. 
The Secretary of the Environment proposes to adopt the Maryland Building Energy Performance Standards, or BEPS, regulation. This proposal includes a new site subtitle 2028 under Title 26 of the Code of Maryland Regulations, COMAR, and four new chapters with regulations, referenced as COMAR 26.28.01-2.26.01. This proposal also includes the withdrawal of a previous notice of proposed action on December 15th, 2023. The purpose of today's hearing is to give the public an opportunity to comment on the proposed regulation. The purpose of this action is to create the Maryland Building Energy Performance Standards, BEPS, as required by the Climate Solutions Now Act, CSNA, of 2022. In 2022, the Maryland General Assembly passed the CSNA that modified Maryland's greenhouse gas emission reduction goals in response to the latest science indicating that more stringent goals are necessary to combat climate change. The CSNA sets new goals to reduce statewide greenhouse gas emissions by 60% below 2006 levels by 2031 and achieve net zero emissions by 2045. Among the requirements outlined in the Hi, law- Hi, Zach, this is, is Mar Carolyn with MD. Right, suddenly, I lost the connection, so couldn't hear the rest of your speech. Am I the only one? Carolyn, we can, can you hear. hear me we can hear you loud and clear. I can hear. We can hear. All right. I will start over this section, though, for good measure. The purpose of this action is to create the Maryland Building Energy Performance Standards, or BEPS, as required by the C Climate Solutions Now Act, CSNA, of 2022. In 2022, the Maryland General Assembly passed the CSNA that modified Maryland's greenhouse gas emissions, or GHG, reduction goals in response to the latest science, indicating that more stringent goals are necessary to combat climate change. CSNA set new goals to reduce statewide GHG emissions by 60% below 2006 levels by 2031 and achieve net zero emissions by 2045. Among the requirements outlined in the law is that Maryland implement BEPS. CSNA requires MDE to develop BEPS for covered buildings that achieve a 20% reduction in net direct greenhouse gas emissions on or before January 1st, 2030, as compared with the 2005 levels for average buildings of similar construction. Attain net zero direct greenhouse gas emissions on or before January 1st, 2040, and include in the regulation energy use intensity targets by building type. In this action, MDE is withdrawing the previously proposed regulation and per the requirements of the fiscal year 2025 budget, proposing a BEPS that only includes the net direct emission standards. Covered buildings will be required to benchmark energy use utilizing the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Energy Star Portfolio Manager tool, which is a free interactive resource management tool that enables the benchmarking of energy use of any type of building. Covered buildings are subject to interim performance standards beginning in 2030 and running through 2039 and to a final performance standard that must be achieved on an annual basis in 2040 and beyond. The proposed regulation applies to buildings in Maryland that are 35,000 square feet or larger, excluding the parking garage area. Historic buildings, public and non-public elementary and secondary school buildings, manufacturing buildings, agricultural buildings, and federal buildings are exempt. A preliminary analysis shows that there are approximately 9,000 covered buildings in Maryland located across all counties. Electric and gas companies and, in limited cases, tenants in covered buildings are required to maintain and provide energy consumption data for covered buildings. This regulation requires covered building owners to report data to MDE through the EPA's Energy Star Portfolio Manager tool. Benchmarking will begin in 2025 and compliance with the net direct greenhouse gas emission standards will begin in 2030. A study by the US Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory indicates that approximately one in three covered buildings have already achieved their final net direct greenhouse gas emission standards set for 2040. However, many owners of covered buildings may need to make improvements to their buildings to meet the interim or final standards. 
covered buildings must meet interim standards in 2030 through 2039 and final standards in 2040 and beyond or make an alternative compliance payment. Interim and final standards are set in the regulation. MDE will conduct an update analysis after the 2025 benchmarking data are submitted in 2026 to determine if the interim and or final standards need to be modified based on 2025 benchmark building energy performance. At this time, at that time in 2026, MDE will also evaluate the energy use intensity of buildings. Electric companies and gas companies are required to maintain and provide energy consumption data for all covered buildings and provide to the building owner accurate and timely information on the actual amount of electricity, gas, or fuel delivered to a covered building. District energy companies are required to provide information on the emissions intensity of their district energy system to their customers. A tenant of a covered building is required to provide requested benchmarking information to a covered building owner that cannot otherwise be acquired from other sources. Between 2025 20, and 2040, building owners whose buildings do not already meet the BEP standards will be required to implement energy efficiency measures and or electrification measures or make an alternative compliance payment. As building owners implement these measures, they or their tenants may begin to save money from reduced energy costs. Savings from reduced energy costs accumulate and increase over time and beyond the initial implementation period for BEPS. On Results energy, from a 2024 that? study by the U.S. Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory demonstrate that during BEPS implementation from 2025 to 2040, under the current regulation that includes emission standards but does not yet include energy use intensity standards, all covered buildings combined will spend more on efficiency measures, 205 million, and electrification measures, 5.53 billion, than the energy cost savings accrued in this period, 1.2 billion. On a longer time horizon from 2025 to 2050, energy cost savings increased to 4.6 billion. On average, over the 2025 to 2050 time horizon, covered buildings spend 65 cents per square foot. However, there is significant variation with 25% of covered buildings modeled to save more than six, per, six cents per square foot and 25% of covered buildings modeled to spend more than $2.65 per square foot. Modeling from the National Lab shows that future site energy use intensity standards will lead most owners to cost savings. During BEPS implementation from 2025 to 2040 under a future regulation that includes emissions and EUI standards, all covered buildings combined will spend more on efficiency measures, 8.8 .8 billion, and electrification measures, 6.4 billion, than the energy cost savings accrued in this period, 8.96 billion. However, on a longer time horizon from 2025 to 2050, energy cost savings increased to 2023 billion, indicating a net savings for Maryland's covered buildings. On average, over that 2025, to 2050 time horizon, covered buildings will save $4.44, 47 cents per square foot. However, there is significant variation with 25% of covered buildings modeled to save more than $9.29 per square foot and 25% of covered buildings modeled to spend more than $4.43 per square foot. The savings in costs may impact small businesses that are covered building owners and may also impact small businesses that are tenants in buildings covered by BEPS. The Building Energy Transition Implementation Task Force created by the Climate Solutions Now Act is an advisory body that earlier this year finalized a report for the governor and the General Assembly recommending actions the state can take to help owners of covered buildings comply with BEPS. Additionally, through the efforts of various state agencies, significant funding from the Federal Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act are expected to reduce costs of compliance with BEPS for Maryland's affected sources and speed their return on investment. According to the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab study on peak demand impacts from BEPS, the greenhouse gas emission standard alone will increase peak electric demand in 2040. This would eventually require additional grid improvements paid for by electric ratepayers. With a future incorporation of site EUI standards, the public in Maryland could see economic benefits through reduced electricity rates due to, the imp due to BEPS reducing the strain on the electricity grid. A copy of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory's Peak Electricity Demand Study is posted on MDE's website. There are substantial emissions benefits as well. 
According to Maryland's greenhouse gas emissions inventory, direct fuel use in buildings produced nearly 14 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent in 2020. Electricity consumption, most of which was consumed in buildings, generated approximately 18 million metric tons in 2020. Through their direct fuel use and electricity consumption combined, Maryland's buildings accounted for roughly a third of all statewide greenhouse gas emissions. Buildings covered by BEPS accounted for approximately 5 million metric tons of emissions in 2020. In combination with state and federal policies to achieve 100% clean power generation, BEPS is modeled to reduce emissions by approximately 8.8 .8 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent between 2025 and 2050, based on the 2024 study by the U.S. Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. According to a 2023 study by the U.S. Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley and Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, the inclusion of a future site EUI standard is modeled to reduce future emissions by approximately an additional 10 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. MDE encourages all covered buildings to efficiently electrify their buildings to meet the proposed standards. Efficient electrification helps ensure that energy costs for owners and tenants will decrease, not increase, as building systems are electrified. It further enables the covered building stock to electrify at a sufficient scale to achieve the BEPS emission goals and mitigate peak, winter peak electricity demand. This action will not be submitted to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as part of Maryland State Implementation Plan. The department will consider all comments on the proposed regulation before making a decision to adopt this regulation. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Berzola. At this time, are there any public officials who wish to make a statement today? Hearing none, please, uh, for the public, when giving your statement, please identify yourself, spell your name for the record, give your affiliation, and deliver your statement loudly and clearly. To keep the length of this public hearing manageable and respectful of everyone's time, we, re we request that you keep your statement to approximately three minutes. We will have a visible timer to keep track of the time. We res respectfully request if your comments are the same or similar to the previous statement that you may note this in, your brief, in a brief statement and provide your full comments by email to beps.mde at maryland.gov by 5 p.m. today. All written and oral statements will be considered by MDE. Sam? Let's start with the first person ready to speak. All right, thank you, Allison. So first person that we have on the speaker list for today is Marianne Mulcahy. Marianne, uh, if you are uh, present here today, uh, please go and uh, go ahead and begin with your comments. Marianne, just checking in with you. Are you in attendance today? All right. We will, uh, maybe Marianne's having some technical difficulties. We'll move on to speaker number two. That is uh, Mr. Lawrence Bernard. Uh, Lawrence, um, please begin with your comments whenever you're ready. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Lawrence Bernard. I'm an owner and resident. Can you hear me, by the way? Yes, That's we can hear you. Good. Thanks. Yeah, Dr. I'm an owner, owner and resident in the Willoughby of Chevy Chase condominium. The condominium, uh, the Climate Solutions Now Act requires the Department of the Environment to adopt BEPS regulations that include as necessary special provisions or exceptions to account for building age and the unique needs of particular building or occupancy types. The ownership structure of common ownership communities is a unique type of occupancy in which the building is owned by the residents. Almost 100% of our residents comes from the fees we pay to our associations, which are run by owners who volunteer for the benefit of the community. 
The BEPS regulations should reflect the unique, na unique nature of our condominiums and the age of many of our buildings and provide for a program like the Montgomery County Building Performance Improvement Plan for common ownership communities because we have limited financial resources to achieve uh, substantial reductions in our greenhouse gas emissions and energy use will substantially re, uh, de deplete our financial resources so that we cannot meet legal requirements for maintaining our building, including our reserve requirements. And um, like Montgomery County, uh, the regulation should reflect the fact that common ownerships, ownership communities are inherently under-resourced communities, uh, buildings or under-resourced communities. Um, Alternatively, the common ownership communities should be given less stringent standards than the current multi multifamily standards in recognition of the age of our buildings and the unique ownership structure. I'd note that the BPOP, BPIP program would also be appropriate because the CSNA requires the regulations to provide maximum flexibility to owners of covered buildings. And it's also consistent with the items listed in paragraph two of the April 2024 budget amendment. Um, related to this uh, final note is that the current uh, interim standard for 2030 is 0.81 for multifamily buildings. Um, most multifamily buildings in Montgomery, Montgomery County report a substantially higher greenhouse gas emissions number than one. So they will have to reduce their emissions by more than 80%. And that figure should be really applied to individual buildings so that each building uh, is only required to uh, reduce its emissions by 20%. Thank you for this opportunity to address um, this hearing. And uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Decarb, Zach, um, and, and uh, Allison, and especially to Sam, who has been very helpful in uh, organizing this. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for your comment. All right, I'm going to just check off Larry off the list. And our third speaker for today is Jean Anderegg. Jean, if you're independent, how's it going? <laughs> The floor is yeah. yours. Begin okay. Whenever you're ready, and I'll get the Fine. timer up for you. One second. Okay. Well, I'm going to um, just focus on some of the specifics in support, really, of uh, what Larry was just saying. So I'm not going to make the same general comments that he made, but to tell you um, one sort of case study, my condominium building. So I'm Jean Andreg. I'm president of the board of directors of Grosvenor Park Three Condominium Association. We are a 413-unit high-rise built in the 1960s. Um, we have gas, heat, um, uh, hot water, and uh, clothes dryers. We've been doing our best for years um, to become more energy efficient. And as a result, in 2023, we had a 46.3 EUI, and we were in the 94th percentile. So we're doing pretty well. But we continue to try to meet um, the standards and goals as much as possible. So we've looked into the actual cost of electrifying our um, current gas-fueled infrastructure. And what we found is the, um, the, the costs are astronomical and the physical barriers an impossibility. And we'll send you the details because I know my time is limited. But um, basically, converting our, our boilers is not feasible, um, no matter how much money we threw at it, um, because we don't have available space to house the the, um, the boilers that would be needed. And um, the upgrade, we'd have to have four times the electrical capacity we currently have. Um, even doing something as modest as converting glass stoves to electric ones would cost between five and $8 million and displace residents for for unknown numbers of weeks. Um, so the benefits um, versus the cost are totally out of line. And we strongly urge um, you to consider 
uh, as Larry was saying, um, alternative paths, um, such as Montgomery County is investigating, um, especially for buildings who can demonstrate that they have made every possible effort to meet these standards and to be as energy efficient as possible. Um, we'd also like clearer information on how financial hardship will be calculated when determining exemptions from requirements um, for condo communities. This can be complicated. And also clarification on the criteria under which buildings are exempted as affordable housing when we believe we are naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, so again, um, we're just trying to make very clear what the real life costs um, and difficulties buildings such as ours will face in trying to meet these goals. I got that within one minute. <laughs> Thank you very much for Thank your you time very much. today. Thanks for Thank being you with for us. The opportunity. Thank you, Jean. Just going to put a check next to your name there. And we're going to keep moving right along to speaker number four, Miriam Hamilton. Miriam, if you're in attendance today, the, the floor is yours and you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Miriam Hamilton and serve on the board at the Promenade Towers in Bethesda, a 51-year-old cooperative of 1,107 units. Um, I understand that MDE was instructed to demonstrate feasibility of its BEPS, EUI, and ZNC targets before issuing new standards, but instead has left ZNC targets in place. These targets have already been shown to be unaffordable based on the work of AOBA that predicted $40 per square foot or the neighborhood of that number to comply, which for my building would be $54 million. Um, in addition, the lead times of several years for major projects like electrical upgrades make it difficult to meet the interim and final targets, even if we could afford them. So our capital planning is, as a result, extremely uncertain. The ongoing repair and replacement of aging out systems in older buildings require us to retain systems until they reach end of life. And paying for costly purchases not in our budget involves levying special assessments on our residents, taking loans or increasing fees. These are hardships. And in addition, Maryland condos and co-ops face other obstacles. The studies such as those that appear in the Lawrence Livermore report um, don't address electricity availability and the heavier cost to any one condo or, or co-op as part of electrification can exceed $2 million. And that's a number that poses formidable risk to our buildings. The cost studies also don't reflect the escalating price of electricity that we're already paying in the form of steep bills that are predicted to grow substantially over the next few years. Um, the stiff fines for non-compliance additionally cost a building like ours in the tens of millions. Since we're certain to fail at complete electrification for reasons stated above, but instead of rewarding our attempts to reduce carbon, we'll be penalized in ways to bankrupt us. And MDE, as, as mentioned um, by Larry and by Jean, should provide alternative paths to compliance. Um, the exemptions today are limited to buildings with financial distress, no occupancy, or planned de demolition. But any condo or co-op that has to assess residents or take enormous loans to satisfy BEP should be considered distressed. In addition, the MDE should make it, uh, additional affordable electricity available. It should provide options to offset carbon with renewables, and it should rewrite the Inflation Reduction Act 30% tax credit for on-site renewables so as to authorize direct payments that will allow condos and co-ops to take advantage of the credit. And as taxpayers, I believe you owe us this. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and for being with us. All right, moving along to speaker number five, Brittany Baker. Brittany, if you're in attendance today, uh, you have three minutes for your comments. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Brittany Baker. I'm the Maryland Director of Chesapeake Climate Action Network and a resident of Tacoma Park. Prior to my current residence, I lived in a three-unit multifamily building in Tacoma Park. 
And I would like to uh, applaud the Maryland Department of the Environment for your diligent work on the building energy performance standards. Chesapeake Climate Action Network is in full support of this process and of implementing the requirements based on uh, the current outline without any delay. We would like to reiterate that electrifying buildings is the only way to reap the benefits of transitioning our electricity grid to cleaner energy each year that we delay the full adherence of the finalized standards building owners will have opportunities to purchase new fossil fuel appliances which will lock in emissions for decades until the end of life of these appliances Therefore, these regulations must be moved forward without any delay and without any weakening provisions. Further, the alternative compliance uh, language that's already included in the proposed BEPS regulations are an effective on-ramp for covered building owners who may face challenges fully complying with the BEPS. No further alternative compliance language should be added. However, we can effectively increase supports for the various communities, such as the people who um, testified before me by um, Maryland Energy Administration grants, local green banks, and through new programming, including grants, technical support, and consistent education to make sure that everyone is aware of the long-term health and economic benefits of the BEPS. Again, thank you for your hard work. Marylanders are counting on you to finalize these regulations. Thank you for your comments and for being with us. All right, next up on the speaker list is speaker number six, Kim Koble. Kim, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you. and. Uh, Thank you, MDE, for the opportunity to speak on this important regulation. I am Kim Coble. I'm the executive director for the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. And uh, we were very involved in not only the construction, but the passage and now the implementation of the Climate Solutions Now Act. In that act, the, the uh, state was directed to develop the BEPS regulations. and. Um, I want to point out the importance of this. In addition to serving as the executive director of Maryland LCB, I also co-chair the Maryland Commission on Climate Change. And I want to remind folks that that commission voted to recommend that Maryland adopt the BEPS regulation. So it, the other point is that there are three other states that currently have enacted statewide BEPS, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington. So this can be done. We've been directed by the legislature and by the commission um, to put them in place. So we urge immediate adoption of them. Um, as one of the speakers ahead of me pointed out, buildings provide about a third of the greenhouse gas emissions in Maryland and therefore are a top priority to be addressed. An important part of this regulation are, are the EUIs and they are need to be there in order to strengthen the BEPS and provide a better rate of return um, and promote energy efficiency. So they need to be included. Uh, I wanna point out also that the BEPS with just emission standards alone would increase peak electricity demand and therefore we have to adopt the energy efficiency standards as part of the BEPS per the Climate Solutions Now Act and I'm urging MDE to do so. Uh, another point I want to make is communities of color, low wealth communities, communities living near industrial zoned areas bear an unfair burden of harmful air pollution. So we must ensure that the benefits of these standards reach all corners of our communities as we move forward. Implementing BEPS equitably to maximize benefits to Maryland's frontline environmental justice and low-income communities is vital. Last point I wanna make is that I urge uh, MDE and Governor Moore and his administration to support an ongoing permanent revenue source for these climate programs. We've heard from previous speakers about the financial impacts of them. We need a revenue source to help to help offset those. 
um, and also to not compromise uh, meeting our climate goals. We can do both. So I urge uh, passage in support of a revenue source. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, next up on the speakers list, we have Scott Waitleverch. Scott, if you're in attendance, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Scott Waitlevich with uh, Columbia Gas of Maryland, and I speak today on our behalf, uh, but also on behalf of our customers who own or operate buildings in Maryland that are 35,000 square feet or larger. Uh, as indicated in prior BEPS regulation comments and, and testimony, we continue to have significant concerns with the proposed regulations, including the September 6th version filed in the Maryland Register. As you may know, Columbia is a natural gas utility providing energy to more than 34,000 residential, commercial, and industrial customers in western Maryland counties of Garrett, Allegheny, and Washington. Columbia and Chesapeake Utilities will submit more detailed joint written comments this afternoon. But as we have stated previously, we believe diversity ensures the strength of and resilience of any system. That's why it's essential for Maryland's residents to leverage a diverse array of energy sources to ensure an equitable energy future for all. Unfortunately, the proposed BEPS regs do not ensure an equitable energy future for owners and operators of Maryland buildings that are 35,000 square feet or larger. On behalf of ourselves and our customers, uh, I want to uh, point out some specific concerns. The financial impact to our customers who own and operate buildings uh, that are 35,000 square feet or larger is staggering. Uh, Dr. Brizola reviewed some of those, so I won't go into it, but uh, basically in the short term, you're talking about millions of billions of dollars uh, in electrification and efficiency measures to achieve a much lower number of billions of dollars in any energy cost savings. The regulations are not a cost-effective path to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we point out again, these significant costs will ultimately be paid for by all Marylanders, like residential res rental tenants, small business owners who rent space, college students and their parents, medical patients at hospitals and offices, parents with children enrolled in preschool or daycare facilities, senior citizens in senior living community or care facilities, owners of condominium units who have testified here today, and Marylanders who buy groceries, just to name a few of those impacted by the billions of dollars in new costs that will be incurred due to the BEPs. In light of the July 30th PJM interconnection power market auction, which produced an almost 800% increase in electric power prices, possibly for 25, 26, we believe the estimates of economic impacts in the proposed regulation need to be re-examined via an updated economic study before finalization of the regulation uh, takes place. And we re respectfully request MDE to conduct such an analysis prior to final implementation. We believe the energy cost savings estimates will be even less with in the increasing costs and the public and the Maryland General Assembly should be aware of the new economic impact to owners. As been mentioned, a customer compliance pathway is critically important. Uh, that recommendation was made to MDE uh, by the Air Quality Control Advisory Council last, last September. We've been disappointed that MDE has not included some type of compliance pathway uh, to help building owners struggling to achieve the goals, we strongly urge MDE to include that idea and a reasonable process in any final regulation. We highlight the change in the Scott, definition. We, we have we've gotten to three minutes. Could you? Um... Yes. Let, let me just wrap up with um, just want to raise the Energy and Policy Conservation Act. Uh, we believe that federal law. Uh, can preempt uh, this particular regulation. We'd ask MDA, MDE to look at that and uh, certainly look at this regulation as a whole before final implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us and for your comments. We look forward to receiving the detailed uh, comments. Thank you. All right, moving on to speaker eight. We have either Henry Jordan or Jim Lieberman here today to, to speak with us. Henry or Jim, are you in attendance? I am. So, we are. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jim Lieberman. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Leisure World Community Corporation. Leisure World is a senior 55 plus adult private gated community in Silver Spring, Maryland, which has 32 buildings subject to BEPS impacting 3,432 residents. While Leisure World supports the goal of reducing greenhouse gases, our community faces significant challenges in meeting BEPS and the associated reporting requirements. To address these issues, Leisure World respectfully recommends for the reasons explained in our written comments that we've submitted for the record on September 28th, that the regulations be amended to consider the following recommendations. First, grandfather the all electric buildings on a master meter that are over 40 years old. Older all electric buildings constructed under a master meter configuration may not have adequate wiring and electrical supply capacity and have other structural limitations, which will have significant financial burden on common ownership communities. Second, if the first recommendation is not adopted, provide an exemption process in Regulation 26.28.02 to exempt from benchmarking all electric buildings with no carbon dioxide emissions provided there's sufficient evidence to demonstrate a high likelihood of meeting EUI standards. The financial burden to retrofit uh, metering should not be needed if clear evidence exists of the building meeting the EUI standards. Three, modify regulation 26.28.01.02B27C to permit including within the gross floor area and closed balconies and underground parking garages. Currently, as the regulations exist, the electricity and gas utilized used to light, heat, and ventilate garages and residential enclosed balconies are counted as emissions. However, the space of the balconies and underground parking areas are not permitted to be uh, counted. Four, limit compliance with the standards to only the common areas of condominium buildings and exempt the residences owned by individuals within the condominiums, which should be considered similar to standalone residences. Only in the common areas can be modified to meet BEPS if approved by a council of unit owners in a condominium. Changes to comply with BEPS within an individual residential unit require changes to condominium bylaws. Fifth, grandfather current HVAC and gas utilization equipment with a mandate to improve or change the equipment only when the existing units need replacement. Six, exempt all senior 55 plus common ownership buildings. And importantly, number seven, delay state regulations until the state and Montgomery County agree on common standards. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jim, for joining us and for your comments. All right, bear with me one second. I'm just going to make a, an addition to the speaker list. Thanks for being here, Dave. All right. Next up on the speaker list, we have speaker number nine, James Stark. James, if you're in attendance, uh, you can begin whenever you're ready. Yep, I, I am here. Again, my name is uh, Jim Stark. I'm the VP of Hotel Operations for uh, the Best Western Plus BWI Airport. Uh, Rumble Mills in uh, Howard County. We are a 133 room hotel. Uh, even though we might be part of a, a franchise, we are a small business. And I'm also a member of the Maryland Hotel Lodging Association. Um, and they're going to be submitting um, some written comments later on today, along with the American Hotel Lodging Association. So when this sort of came out and we sort of wrapped our head around it, um, I wanted to take my hotel, uh, again, 133 rooms, that's a mid sized hotel in the state of Maryland, the average size hotel is about 110 rooms and do a case study, what this would mean to us. Uh, and I've been at the hotel since 2001, the hotel opened in 1988. Um, so very working knowledge of, of you know, mechanics and engineering, uh, electrical, everything. So I sat my team down from my electrical engineer to my mechanical engineer and say, okay, hey, listen, here are the standards. What would this mean to me from a cost perspective and just an implementation perspective to achieve? Um, if you just look at 
you know, round numbers, rough costs just to replace the equipment, which was essentially for us be boilers, uh, laundry equipment, because we have gas dryers, most hotels do, and you have pool heaters. If pool heaters aren't exempt, we would have to do that as well. Uh, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars just in the cost of the equipment. Um, and then my my engineers were like, well, okay, that, that's fantastic, but why would you do that? Because the equipment that's available to you is way less efficient, less efficient um, with the electrification than it would be to use gas. And you know, so not only would it be less efficient from a time perspective, how long it would take to heat water, how long it would take to dry clothes, um, but now you're having to use more electricity to achieve the same end desire. So that's a cost that's going to make the, our electric costs go up. And I'll pause to say this, a lot of folks on the call, the Zoom may not realize that next June, because of federal legislation that passed, all of our energy costs are going to, to, to go up. Our electric delivery costs are going to go up effective next June. And it's going to go up exponentially. I know for us, just in the first year, that would be an extra $30,000 right like that, right off the bottom line. Uh, I know I only have a minute left, so I'll try to go really quickly here. So then the next issue that came up, and again, this, these are engineers that I'm talking to. This is not out of my head. These are out of experts, would be the demand on the grid. There's going to be so much more increased demand on the grid that's already nearing being strained by everything else that's being electrified now, cars, so on and so forth, and then the demand on my building. So when we're, again, a hotel and we're near peak occupancy, you know, and I have such a draw coming in, they honestly don't think I'm, I have enough capacity coming into the building. And I essentially have a gun held to my head by me, BG&E, to upgrade that. And gosh, only knows how, how you know, high that, that number could be. And I'll end with this and I could say a lot more. But the hotel business, we're about our guests, we're about hospitality, we're about our communities. Hotels have done a lot the last 10, 15 years to become more, more green, more energy efficient, more caring, more loving across the board. We will do everything that we can. To, to make the guest experience as awesome as it can be. But I think a little bit more time and credence needs to be given to the grid and the extra draw and demand that some of our buildings, being the age that they are, would, would have upgrades that either aren't achievable or just don't make economic sense. So with that, um, I'll put a cherry on top. Thank you very much. Like hearing all the comments. Thank you, Jim, for being with us and for the cherry. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have speaker number 10, Josh Talkin. Josh, if you're in attendance, please begin whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Josh Talkin. I'm the director of the Maryland chapter of the Sierra Club. On behalf of our 70,000 members and supporters, I am pleased to offer these comments. Sierra Club works to address the threat of climate change and to support policies which shift Maryland towards clean, renewable energy and a sustainable future. We recognize that climate change poses an existential threat, not just to the planet, but a specific and unique threat to Maryland, uh, which is especially vulnerable given its coastline uh, to uh, urban heat island effects. And we recognize that a shift to clean energy not only addresses environmental issues, but health um, issues as well. Maryland has set ambitious goals to be a national climate leader. Um, and Governor Moore has rightly pointed out that this will require a whole of society approach, not just a whole of government, but a whole of society approach, where every person, every sector will need to do their part. Being a national leader will require change or require action. And we believe that these regulations have been debated, discussed, and now recently amended, um, and are now in an appropriate place we urge MDE to finalize and implement, implement the regulations without delay. Um, people have brought up important uh, points today about some of the challenges that will go along with implementation of this standard. Uh, there are many efforts underway to provide technical support. There is an alternative compliance pathway for buildings for whom it is not financially viable to make some of the upgrades. There are efforts underway to address reliability issues and ensure that our electric grid uh, will be adapting to the needs of electrification. When we have long-term ambitious goals, there will be an ongoing process. Uh, there are significant new financial support systems at the federal and state level for condominiums, multifamily housing, commercial buildings. And right now, new um, 
financial systems and rebates are being created by the Empower Maryland program uh, to support electrification um, and reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, we welcome and would love to engage with people who have questions about compliance. I was at the Maryland Clean Energy Center conference last night and there were uh, very, very robust conversations about new financial mechanisms coming online. Uh, for all of these reasons, we support the standards as written. I believe they have addressed the General Assembly concerns that were raised um, and we urge them to be implemented as written. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and for being with us today. Thank you. All right, next up we have Rick Bremen. Rick, if you're in attendance, please begin whenever you're ready. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity today to express my comments. My name is Rick Bremen and I operate Atlantic Realty Group, a small family owned business that owns and operates uh, about 2000 multifamily apartments, primarily in Baltimore City. I am here today also as a board member of the Maryland Multifamily Housing Association, in which its members operate over 210,000 apartments, over 958 communities. We also did submit written comments, which, will go, which goes into great detail about the proposed regulations. My comments today highlight the impact on housing costs and EUI. The performance standards known as EUIs described in section 26.28.03 will put an unnecessary financial burden on multifamily owners and the residents they serve. EUI or other schemes to ration the usage of energy is not permitted under the Federal Policy and Conservation Act, EPCA. Therefore, this preempts any scheme MDE is attempting to put into the regulations. The cost to achieve the standards will be upwards of $40,000 per apartment, which will result in rents being increased by $600. There are not enough subsidies available to property owners in order to lower the investment and to keep rent levels affordable for residents of Maryland that are already struggling with meeting financial commitments. <clears throat> States that were early adopters in creating BEPs and schemes to eliminate or scale back natural gas are now, are now having buyer's remorse. And these local and state governments are losing in court because what they're doing is illegal. Oregon re repealed their natural gas appliance ban in 2023. Berkeley, California attempted to ban natural gas cooking equipment and lost under the preemption of EPCA. Washington State approved the November 2024 ballot initiative that moves to make it illegal for any local and state government to ban natural gas usage for homes and businesses. In May 2024, the state of Colorado was sued by the Colorado Hotel and Lodging Association, along with the Colorado Apartment Association, over BEPS due to the preemption of EPCA. California considered a two-year delay in their data reporting, but landed at six months, a six-month delay despite the recommendation by, the, by their governor this past summer. There is one thing in common with all these local and state governments. They failed to work closely with the business community, property owners, housing providers, and residents on sensible solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The proposed BEPS regulations will see a similar demise as the other states did. MDE needs to consider the removal of EUI standard to allow the naturally occurring market demands to mature, which will allow for the original premise of the Climate Solutions Now Act to thrive, which was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you for your time today and allow me to speak. Thank you for your comments and for being with us. Thank you. All right, next on the <laughs> list, we have Brian and Lou. Brian, if you're here today, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Brian Anlu, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Apartment and Office Building Association of Metropolitan Washington. AOBA represents 133,000 apartment units and over 23 million square feet of office space in Montgomery and Prince George's counties. AOBA is concerned about the impact that BEPS will have on housing affordability and the struggling office market in the state. With this lens, AOBA staff reviewed the publicly disclosed benchmarking data for both Montgomery and Montgomery County and DC. Our staff expects that the statewide benchmarking data will be similar to those two jurisdictions. Staff found that the proposed regulations result in deeper emissions reductions than the 20% reduction by 2030 and 60% reduction by 2035 that the Climate Solutions Now Act requires. 
Montgomery County multifam as a result, Montgomery County multifamily and office buildings will need to reduce net direct emissions by more than twice the proposed 2030 interim standards. This creates a near-term crisis for building owners that requ would have required deeper levels of retrofit work than otherwise necessary. Adjusting the first interim targets to the Climate Solutions Now Act will allow building owners to implement less costly efficiency measures in the short term while planning for electrification to meet the subsequent targets. MDE must adjust the interim targets to align with the emissions reductions required by the Climate Solutions Now Act. We also ask that MDE add true alternative compliance pathways to meet BEPS as allowed in Montgomery and Prince George's counties, sorry, Montgomery County and DC. Allowing alternative compliance pathways aligns with the CSNA's provisions that allow for greater flexibility when accounting for building age and regional differences. The alternative compliance fees proposed by the regulations are not a true alternative compliance pathway because they will raise costs for building owners and further jeopardize housing affordability in the state. On the housing affordability front specifically, we urge MDE to expand the definition of affordable housing from being tied to tenant incomes to one that is tied to rent levels affordable to tenants making 80% or less of the area median income. This distinction is less invasive for both the housing provider and the tenants and will ease the cost burden of complying with BEPS for naturally occurring affordable housing properties. Lastly, we urge MDE to conduct its own case studies on a selection of buildings representative of the state's building stock to determine the true cost of meeting BEPS and to identify the appropriate funding levels required to offset these costs without hurting our affordable housing and again, as I said, our struggling office market. We'll be submitting detailed written comments later this afternoon, and we encourage you to read them in detail and closely for other recommended improvements to the BEP regulations. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being with us and for your comments. All right, next up we have Kevin Walton. Kevin, if you're in attendance, please begin whenever you're ready. Yes, great. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kevin Walton and I represent the Climate Coalition of Montgomery County. We are a group of 20 climate and environment focused organizations working together in the county to promote an effective response to the climate emergency. My own experience with building energy standards comes from serving as the chair of the Montgomery County BEPS Advisory Board. And I also was a subgroup co-chair for the Maryland Building Energy Transition Implementation Task Force. The Climate Coalition supports the Maryland Department of Environment's proposed building energy performance standards and urges the finalization and implementation of those of these important regulations without delay and without any weakening provisions. The hurricanes now hitting the United States are virtually unprecedented, and their destructive force has been powered by the higher ocean and gulf temperatures, a direct result of climate change. We must always have these kinds of events in mind when we think about what we can do to limit the impact of climate change. Implementing the BEPS regulations is exactly one of these actions that we can take to help mitigate climate change and limit its impact on the residents of Maryland. These regulations require large buildings to zero out their greenhouse gas emissions and are a key component of Maryland's emission reduction commitments. The transition away from fossil fuels also brings many additional benefits to building owners and tenants. These regulations will, do, will lead to decreased energy use, generating savings to owners and tenants. Projected increases in the cost of gas over the next decades is expected to outstrip increases in electricity costs, continually generating these savings over many years. And the installation of more efficient, cleaner electric appliances will reduce residents' exposures to harmful indoor air pollution, including in rental properties where residents often have less control over which appliances they can use. We also support the benchmarking requirements to establish baselines for building energy use. These data will be critical to help owners make informed decisions about building upgrades. And lastly, there are unprecedented levels of funding and other incentives available from the federal government to support these building upgrades. Importantly, some of these are only available for a limited time and delays in the implementation of these regulations would deprive the building owners of taking their full advantage. Therefore, the Climate Coalition urges the rapid approval and implementation of these regulations. Thank you very much for your time and attention and the opportunity to speak. Thank you for being with us and for your comments. All right, next up we have Emily Scar. Emily, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Emily Scar. I'm a senior advisor with Marilyn Perg and the Marilyn Perg Foundation. Uh, Marilyn Perg Foundation is a statewide nonpartisan nonprofit group based in Baltimore uh, with public debate around many issues often dominated by special interests. Marilyn Perg Foundation offers an independent voice that works on behalf of the public. Uh, laws only work if we implement them and we all Oh, sorry, my sick daughter just walked in, so she might say hi. Uh, we all know the devil is in the details. Who is that? Shh, I'm talking. So who? I'm talking to a bunch of people about cleaning up our buildings and making them waste less energy. Yeah, I don't care. Okay. Um, so we know that crafting these regulations <laughs> is critical to meeting the Can intent of the, the Climate Solutions it? Now Act. Uh, we cannot meet our state's climate goals without strong regulations to reduce energy waste in our buildings, especially our large buildings. And while we know these retrofits and updates won't happen overnight, implementing the regulations will lead to improved air quality and lower energy costs for Maryland renters and commercial tenants. As Kevin mentioned, when it comes to energy costs, the cost of gas delivery has escalated dramatically in Maryland, doubling for many utilities in the last decade and is only expected to escalate further. Uh, the safest, cleanest, and most affordable energy is the energy we don't use. Uh, without proper public policy and regulation, large building owners have little reason to improve the efficiency of their buildings, and tenants in small businesses are often trapped with inefficient and polluting technology. Uh, thankfully, we do have the tools available to make our equipment more uh, efficient and our homes safer, and then ultimately powered by clean renewable sources as we clean up the grid. And so by encouraging large building owners to improve the efficiency um, and reduce on-site burning of fossil fuels, we believe these new standards can save families and businesses money while also making the buildings we live, work, and play in safer, healthier, and more resi resilient. Excuse me. Um, thanks to robust incentives from both the state and federal government, there's no better time than right now to complete the benchmarking and enact these standards. I would also echo calls from others that the state can and should do more in the years to come to expand incentives and support to speed the transition. I also want to flag how critical it is for MDE to add new goals for energy use intensity once the benchmarking is complete. A failure to do so will leave renters and tenants vulnerable to building owners replacing gas systems with outdated and inefficient electric systems such as baseboard heating and inefficient electric water heaters that would continue to be wasting energy and trapping people with even increased energy bills. So thanks again for your time and apologies for my daughter who picked as usual the exact right time to come talk to me. I did? Yeah. Thank you for joining us and for her as well and for your comments. All right, moving along to speaker number 15, Aaron Mintzes. Aaron, if you're in attendance, you can begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to uh, provide comment on the uh, Maryland Building Energy Performance Standards. Uh, my name is Aaron Minces, as uh, spelled in the speaker list. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, and I am speaking on, I'm a Maryland resident, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself. And I want to make clear quickly about that disclaimer uh, in a second, um, because I'm going to be speaking about uh, not for, but about my own synagogue and how the proposed Maryland uh, BEPS will potentially apply to my own synagogue. Um, let me start off by saying I strongly support this rule. I strongly support this rule and deeply appreciate the mandate. I also want to um, clearly um, identify myself um, with the comments we heard earlier from Ms. Scar from Maryland Perg, as well as her daughter, um, Mr. Tolkien of Maryland Sierra Club, uh, Ms. Kolba. Uh, Ms. Coble of the Maryland League of Conservation Voters and uh, Ms. Baker of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Um, I belong to a uh, synagogue here in Baltimore. It's a 118,000 square foot campus of covered buildings. Um, we are a tax exempt charitable entity. Um, and I don't speak for the synagogue, but I've been speaking to them and learning about, for example, the Empower Maryland supported level two energy audit that our synagogue conducted in order to comply with the proposed standards. So I sympathize with some of the other speakers we've heard before about the compliance costs. Um, it's gonna cost us about two and a half million dollars, we think. So I want you to know clearly, I strongly support this rule. This is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna get it done. We're gonna do it with your help. We're gonna do it a couple of ways. And I wanted to, I have a minute, this is gonna be easy. Okay, 
um, I'm going to highlight two ways in which uh, the government can assist us as we comply toward um, meeting a net zero by 2040. As mentioned earlier, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, in particular 179D, Delta, the um, tax credit for commercial buildings for energy efficiency retrofits. As we heard from Ms. Koble, it's essentially important that the task force implementation be put into law, recommendation to for a state level match for the 179D federal IRA tax credit, as well as a state grant program, perhaps a loan forgiveness program for tax exempt uh, entities too. That could be administered through MDE or MEA or both. I don't have, I don't have strong feelings about that. We have a lot, I have 15 seconds. So we have a lot of state and fiscal policy work that must occur in the next 10 or 15 years to make this affordable. And it can be done through the direct pay provisions of the IRA tax credit and through state matching tax credits, as well as loans and grants. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being with us and for your comments. All right, next up we have speaker number 16, Hannah Allen. Hannah, uh, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thanks, Sam. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hannah Allen, Director of Government Affairs at the Maryland Chamber of Commerce. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide public comment today. You, MDE, will receive our written comments this afternoon, so I'm not going to go through those in depth, but I do want to touch on um, two things, the manufacturing definition along with um, really just broader impacts and concerns that our membership has. So. Uh, to touch on manufacturing, the definition used for manufacturing buildings was changed in the revised version of the regulations and now provides what the industry views as a narrower definition that fails to explicitly exempt the manufacturing sector as a whole. Um, currently, the regulation uses a limited portion of the manufacturing definition under Environment Article 2-1202 excluding important components like research and development um, that are really important and integral to manufacturers and manufacturing buildings. Um, so we do recommend that the department use the federal standard or at the minimum include the entirety of subsection H under 2-1202, just to be sure that all of the manufacturing sector is included in that exemption and, and there's none that are left behind. Um, and then I'll also take the rest of the time to note that, you know, we're at a time where the state is facing a real, real economy wide challenges like the closure of generation facilities, increased electricity demand, you know, a, a growing strained grid, the cost of electricity expected to increase significantly due to the recent PJM capacity auction, you know, ongoing inflation, the list goes on, other factors playing out through policy decisions that are being made at the state and federal level. So adding these additional costs on Maryland businesses and job creators is, is really concerning. Um, there, there are ways to make the regulation more achievable and more practical for building owners while still achieving meaningful reductions, which you can find uh, that I write more about in our, in our detailed comments. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we don't want to make it any more difficult for businesses to choose to invest in Maryland and grow our economy and create jobs and grow our tax base. Um, so I would I would encourage and I hope that the department will seriously review and consider the recommendations that we included in our written comments. And I know that many others wrote about as well in their comments. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you for being with us and for your comments. We look forward to receiving the comments via email. All right, next up we have Joel Rosenberg. Joel, if you're in attendance, you can begin whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, thanks for the time. Uh, my name is Joel Rosenberg. I'm from Rewiring America, a national nonprofit geared towards electrifying everything for everyone. Uh, we are in strong favor of the BEPS requirements that will help implement Maryland's Climate Solutions Now Act uh, we've kicked the climate can down the road as a society for almost my entire lifetime, and we're just now almost out of time to finally fix the problem, but it's not too late if we act swiftly and decisively. So looking at the September 6th Maryland Register entry, which cites the 2024 Berkeley Lab study, uh, they found that with both emissions and EUI standards, there will be a net savings for Maryland's covered buildings between 25 and 2050. So in fact, the register, uh, frames it initially as a money loser throughout the BEPS period through 2040, 
citing around $15 billion spent on efficiency and electrification and only $9 billion saved. But then it says that through 2050, uh, those buildings will save another $13 billion over that following decade. And presumably those buildings will continue to save billions of dollars over the rest of the century. And I think this is just the energy economics and doesn't include the benefits from the reduced risk of climate disaster. It's also worth noting that there are federal and state incentives to help pay for these BEPS upgrades. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which has been mentioned several times, includes the 179D tax deduction of up to $5 per square foot for energy reductions in buildings. And that's very much in line with the BEPS requirements. Uh, the IRA also includes the 45L tax credit for multifamily housing who can get $500 to $5,000 per unit for making them energy efficient. There's also a 30 to 50% tax credit for rooftop solar and battery storage, which could be included in future site EUI requirements and help to expand the options for meeting uh, the requirements and boosting the state's still fairly meager solar energy production. Maryland's Empower program includes commercial incentives for electric appliances, the MEA, Maryland Clean Energy Center, and green banks like Montgomery counties all provide financing for these upgrades. Uh, there are many forces that are starting to work together to help address our extremely wasteful use of energy in buildings, and Maryland is in a good position to start tying them together. Yes, I understand there are upfront costs for these upgrades, and we need to be sensitive to individual buildings' uh, financial situations, but it's very clear that these are investments that will pay back and that will keep paying back with improved buildings and lower energy use. And BEPS, really, it's just a baselining tool initially where building owners can understand where they are now and then uh, figure out a plan to make an investment to meet the needs of the building, but also the needs of the state and the world. So please, we urge you uh, to, enforce, to make BEPS requirements strong, enforceable, and urgent. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us and for your comments. Next up, we have Jeannie Morris. Jeannie, if you're in attendance, you can begin whenever you're ready. I am here. Good afternoon. My name is Jeannie Morris, and I am the Vice President of Government Affairs for Vicinity Energy. First, I want to thank the MDE team for being open and collaborative as we work through this very important regulation. Um, for those not familiar with Vicinity, we are the largest owner and operator of district energy systems in North America. Here in Baltimore, we provide steam, hot water, and chilled water to roughly 35 million square feet of commercial space from hospitals to universities to the stadium authority. Uh, basically, we eliminate the need for on-site natural gas boilers and chiller plants. Um, right now, more than half the steam we produce comes from renewable um, renewable energy and we're on track to hit net zero carbon emissions by 2045. Uh, frankly, I think we're going to get there a lot sooner and we're going to do this through the installation of centralized electric boilers and uh, industrial scale heat pumps. With respect to BEPS, uh, we appreciate MDE's most recent decision to use the term products instead of users as it relates to emissions factors for district energy systems under BEPS compliance. This distinction allows for separate emissions factors for our steam products, enabling uh, district steam customers to choose the appropriate amount of emissions-free steam, uh, a product that you might hear us refer to as e-steam to meet their requirements under BEPS. Um, it's also worth noting that electrifying every building individually in Baltimore would place a tremendous strain on the uh, electric grid. District energy systems like ours offer a more efficient centralized solution that not only reduces emissions, but also alleviates uh, the stress on the electrical grid. Like others who have spoken before me, vicinity fully supports BEPS because Frankly, we cannot address climate change without recognizing that in cities like Baltimore, commercial buildings account for a significant portion of carbon emissions, particularly in those communities that have historically borne the brunt of climate impacts. Um, so I'll close by saying that we are excited to continue working with MDE and the state of Maryland, uh, the city of Baltimore's, Baltimore and our customers to bring real tangible benefits to the communities we serve. Thank you. Thank you for being with us and for your comments today. 
All right, next on the speaker list, we have Chris Parts. Chris, if you're here, uh, you can begin whenever you're ready. Sure, good afternoon all. Uh, I'm Chris Parts, P-A-R-T-S <clears throat> with AIA Maryland, uh, representing our architects across the state. Um, AIA National has been tracking building energy uh, use and predict, um, predicted EUI since 2009 with our goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2030. I'll share some of the information that we've been tracking to demonstrate capability to achieve the proposed state goals. We now have 428 member firms tracking projects in design and construction. My office joined 13 years ago and we've been tracking this information across all five of our offices. Across the 23,276 projects documented, um, AIA achieved a 48% uh, uh, predicted energy use intensity in last year's numbers, well on the way to the 60% reduction goal by 2031. Nearly 5% of our member firms are at or above an 80% predicted energy use intensity across all of the projects they do. Sharing, I'm, and I'm sharing this simply to demonstrate, having goals arms us with the information and goals to meet the targets that we have. In my office, tracking this information has driven us and our clients to do better. We're now modeling approximately 80% of all of our housing projects and virtually all of our education projects. Our healthcare sector often does renovation work exclusively, and we're meeting a lowered lighting power density for all of our projects. And we now have a few net zero energy ready projects. We're also now modeling the embodied carbon of 20% of our projects to improve how we plan to reduce not only the operational carbon, but also the embodied carbon. And we're tracking and using that information to guide some decisions that our clients are making. Simply said, hesitation to adopt the BEPS uh, program simply prolongs the needed transition. We don't object to alternate compliance paths as many existing buildings face unique challenges. However, we do encourage acknowledgement the technology efficiencies of, for instance, a radiant uh, um, fossil fuel based system for an electric radiant system may not exist in, uh, and alternate compliance paths should acknowledge technology efficiency in requiring potentially different systems. We encourage the development of case studies while the energy data is being collected and beyond, such as the condominium type projects that were mentioned in earlier testimony. Passage of the proposed BEPS regulations simply takes the necessary set steps to move us toward a lower carbon future. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and look forward to collaborating in the future. Thanks for being with us and for your comments. All right, next up on the lift list, uh, we have Tom Ballantyne. Tom, if you're in attendance, uh, please begin yep, whenever right you're here. ready. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to speak today. My name is Tom Ballantyne. I'm here speaking on behalf of NAOP Maryland. We're a commercial real estate trade association representing about 700 companies that focus on commercial, multifamily, mixed-use real estate in Maryland. Um, <clears throat> our organization continues to have concerns about the cost, the feasibility, timing, and legal authority underlying the regulations and uh, urge MDE and other policymakers to take a more pragmatic approach to what's expected of the building sector and provide the support necessary, necessary for a technically feasible and cost-effective building energy transition. Unlike Empower, the BEPS regulations have no cost-effectiveness test to protect the public from high compliance costs. We don't see the Berkeley PNNL uh, cost-benefit analysis as a substitute. It's based on generalized modeling, dated construction costs, assumptions about future energy prices, that lead to conclusions underestimating the cost of compliance and overestimating the value of energy savings. Even the optimistic payback periods applied in the example building in this study are lower than the 10-year commercial loan term, longer than most CPACE loans, um, and at the outer end or beyond the life expectancy of many mechanical systems, and that was not an aspect that was, that was uh, part of the study. We're detailed, um, more detailed case studies of Maryland buildings have documented higher construction costs and lower energy savings. And we endorse uh, AOBA's call for further building level case studies and especially for warehouses that represent the largest single um, uh, building category regulated by BEPS. 
like to also point out, as others have, there are wide gaps between the published 2030 emissions targets and the reported emissions of existing warehouse, multifamily, and office buildings in Montgomery County. And these comparisons show that the targets are far lower than what was called out in the Climate Solutions Now Act and that they will present potentially insurmountable financial and operational challenges to many multifamily and commercial buildings. The regulation presents a technically narrow set of compliance options. We think the targets uh, result in an unreasonably short timeline for compliance, and it relies heavily on monetary penalties, offering no alternative compliance plan or implementation schedules. The regulation contains provisions that are beyond the authority granted to MDE, and it fails to contain policy provisions. The General Assembly expressly directed MDE to include in BEPS and other climate mitigation plans. So without modifications, we think this regulation will put unsustainable financial pressure on the owners and occupants of hundreds of millions of square feet of commercial space and multifamily buildings appreciate the opportunity to speak and we'll submit written comments. Thank you for being with us today and for your comments. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> next up on the list, we have Maddie Smith. Maddie, if, if you're in attendance today, uh, you can begin whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Maddie Smith and I am the Clean Energy Shepherd at Interfaith Power and Light, DC, Maryland, uh, Northern Virginia. And back when the Climate Solutions Now Act was being considered, um, there was a last minute effort on the floor to try to exempt houses of, worships from, of worship from BEPS. And we, among many others, spoke up against that because our faith communities want to be part of the solution. They want to be leaders on this. And especially they want to save energy and money so that they can use their limited resources for the many other ways that they serve their community. Um, I just want to say that an EUI standard based on benchmarking data is really important because it incentivizes efficient electrification which lowers energy bills and makes sure that upgrades made are done so with the newest and most efficient technologies available. And everyone wants to save money, particularly old congregations, tenants, but really everybody wants to save money, especially those currently stuck with inefficient building systems. Uh, my whole job is about connecting houses of worship with the resources, funding, and expertise that they need to benefit from clean energy. And recently, much of this work has also included supporting more than 50 DC houses of worship currently covered by the district's benchmarking law. Houses of worship want to be a part of benchmarking and BEPS, but they need support and funds to do so. Uh, what I've learned is that benchmarking data is an invaluable tool for a congregation's financial planning, especially when I can go to a small church with limited funds and share how much I think they can save through energy efficiency upgrades and the resources available to pay to help them pay for it. And they really see this as an opportunity to further their ministry and not as a burden particularly because of all the resources that are becoming available that other folks have mentioned. I strongly encourage the state to make sure something like the Montgomery County Green Bank Technical Assistance Program is available for buildings that will be covered by state BEPS. Um, currently, congregations in DC and Montgomery County have very different experiences in the amount of uh, funds they can get to support them with benchmarking and third-party verification. And that is currently the biggest hurdle that I'm encountering in terms of being able to get these congregations to benchmark and get them to, you know, get the data they need to plan both to meet BEPS, but also to just plan uh, for the future and how they can save money. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for being with us and for your comments. All right, moving over to the next page. We have speak, next up speaker number 23, Jared Lyles. Jared, if you're in attendance, you can begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jared Lyles. My name is spelled correctly for the record on the slide here. 
and I'll be remaining off camera. Uh, I work with Maryland Energy Advisors. We are uh, a consulting agency that advises commercial customers and institutions um, on their energy, and we are helping them out with BEPS. I just had a request for clarification on some of the guidance that we had around specific but uh, common building types to include flex office space. Uh, based on the current verbal clarifications and written regulations, it's unclear to us uh, whether this standard applies to uh, flex office park space meeting the criteria of having its own address, HVAC, utility meters, independent entrances, uh, and is separated by a firewall. Um, the criteria listed or uh, applies to flex office spaces and also a group of townhomes whose aggregate goals floor area is greater than 35,000 square feet. Um, we're just asking for clarification in the regulations to help clarify this for building owners to simplify the process. Uh, in an anecdotal survey of five properties meeting the criteria I stated above, uh, none showed up in the potentially covered buildings list. Um, so we are thinking that these types of buildings are exempt, but once again, are not sure. Uh, and thank you. That's it. I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you for being with us and for your comment. Next up, we have Mike O'Halloran. Mike, if you're in attendance, you can uh, start whenever you're ready. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? We, we can, can hear, hear you. Mike. All right, if you just uh, bear with me for a moment, I'm... Take your time. So for the record, my name is uh, Mike O'Halloran. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Mid-Atlantic Petroleum Distributors Association. We have uh, submitted written comments, so I'll be very brief. Um, collectively, our industries continue to stress the importance of a diverse energy portfolio in Maryland. That means avoiding the over-reliance or commitment to a single source policy such as electricity. Our industries have been investing in product development, logistics, and infrastructure for over 150 years and will continue to do so. These regulations encumber those investments and could potentially close the door on other technologies. MAPTA urges the department to consider these comments and make the necessary changes so that Maryland have access to proven and reliable technologies to heat their homes, offices, and buildings. Thank you. Thank you for being with us and for your comments. Next up on the list, we have Sheldon Fishman. Sheldon, you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Sheldon Fishman. Um, we have lived in Silver Springs since 1973, and we raised our four children, graduated from Montgomery County Public Schools. I'm a member of the Climate Coalition of Montgomery County, but I'm here today testifying as an individual um, on behalf of my uh, six grandchildren. And, um, and, and in brief, um, I support the current BEPS standards and um, and the BEP schedule and encourage you to proceed uh, quickly with all, with all of them. And in the interest of time, I fully incorporate I incorporate Ken Walt, uh, Walt, Walton's comments here and save you the time of listening to them once again. And uh, and I'd just like to make one small comment is that uh, all the speakers so far, um, a, a number of speakers so far have mentioned costs. And um, um, but no one has mentioned uh, cost avoidance, and I guess I want to uh, highlight that for you in terms of um, if if we get the fossil fuel um, out of our homes um, and out of our, our businesses, um, we we will avoid uh, risks um, and health adverse health effects, which in turn winds up uh, avoiding costs for all of our residents and also avoids costs for our federal, state, and local uh, agencies. And all that 
cost savings can be applied to providing technical assistance for implementing BEPS. And with that, I will yield back the one minute and 14 seconds. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us and for your comments. All right, next up on the list, we have Dave Tooley. Uh, Dave, you can begin whenever you are ready. Hey, my name is Dave Tooley. I'm the energy manager for MedStar Health. MedStar Health has nine hospitals and one rehab facility spread throughout Maryland and DC. They also have dozens of uh, smaller primary care sites. Some are rentals, some are owned. Um, I'm going to set aside costs for now. Um, personally, I find it a little funny that we're arguing about costs to save the planet. Um, the cost is <laughs> what it is. Um, we also know that it will be expensive, uh, and if it's required, money will show up. It's going to come from some source. Um, financing options are currently available from multiple sources, including energy performance contracts for retrofits. Um, if you wanted to, you could get replacement equipment for everything tomorrow, um, paid for by someone else over time with zero upfront capital. This is a solved problem as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think I want to put some attention on things that I, I think are specific to healthcare and hospitals. Um, I don't think you'll find a single hospital that doesn't support this goal. You know, our mission is uh, health for all, all individuals. Um, the primary issue we have is actually timeline. Um, the timeline is extremely aggressive for what we do specifically. Um, if we need to renovate a hospital or a, a room or a section, we need to close those rooms. Um, that means we need to move patients elsewhere. It's doable with one hospital, but if we all have to comply simultaneously, where do the patients go? Um, every hospital in Maryland is renovating simultaneously, so maybe they have to go out of state. Um, this is kind of the most basic way to express that problem. Uh, we're not making widgets, we're helping people heal. Our ability to do that is limited while we're renovating, um, so I suggest uh, giving hospitals a longer runway uh, to comply. We all want to do it, we just, I don't think we can do it in time. Honestly, if you gave me unlimited funds today, I still couldn't get to the goal in time. Um, at least without serious consequences to public health. Um, to help with this a little bit, I suggest that MD adopt a similar approach to Montgomery County uh, when it comes to renewables specifically. Um, in Montgomery County, any green energy generated on site does not count towards your EUI. It actually works like a negative meter in Portfolio Manager. It subtracts from your EUI. Um, this is great because it's generated on site, means it's not burdening the grid. So who actually cares how much energy you use? Um, and it's 100% green, um, so it's not emitting anything. It meets the goals and the spirit of the legislation. Um, this approach also strongly incentivizes the work that will lessen burden on the grid, um, makes areas more resilient, and I think it's what we need to do to solve this problem. I urge you very strongly to consider it, and thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us and for your comments. All right, and moving on to our final speaker on the list, uh, Ben Roush. You, uh, you have the floor whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, ben Roush. I know that's not how it's spelled. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer. I work for FSI Engineers, uh, have advocated on behalf of Climate Solutions Now, and particularly on behalf of Building Energy Performance Standards, and I want to say I am in support of building energy performance standards. There's a couple things that have been said here that I want to address. Um, one, a very large number, $40,000 for apartment was dropped. And that misses a little nuance in that you have to replace mechanical systems and other electrical plumbing related systems every 15 to 20 years. Some of that electrical can stay for up to 50 years, but there is no forever for the life of the building system in MEP. So that, that cost, that $40,000 has to include all first costs, like you were building a new building when you were already gonna replace that system every 15 to 20 years. Um, on alternate compliance paths, I too would have loved to have seen an alternate compliance path similar to what DC is doing to give a longer runway or a percentage energy reduction for very poor performers. And I also don't believe that you had the legislative capability that wasn't authorized by the by the legislation. So that might be something for for future future movement that everyone can agree on that that we would like to see that and legislatively pass it. 
Uh, gas ban. Somebody mentioned the legislation or um, uh, legal action around gas bans. To be clear, this doesn't seem to be a gas ban. You can always pay your alternate compliance path. Uh, somebody uh, basically said gas is the only reliable fuel, and of course that's not true. Our electric grid is pretty darn reliable, and heat pumps have a very long track record and are now amazing. They blow every bit as hot of air as any other gas-based furnace, boiler, keep going system. So heat, heat pumps are here, they're great. Uh, we were putting them in every day in many, many different project types. Last one, the change I would like to see. Uh, there isn't an allowance, and even when there was a UI target, there was an allowance for, for uh, photovolt on-site generated uh, deductions. And I would like to see some nod towards that on the greenhouse gas side and when EUI comes back on the energy side, uh, allowing a deduction based on what our grid is currently emitting. Uh, if you're generating on site. So basically you didn't take that electricity from the grid. I'd like the building to have an allowance for that based on that year's emissions data. Um, into 2040, assuming we actually hit our target in 2040 and we are greenhouse gas free, that, that deduction would be zero. I'd still like to see it on the EUI side as well. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully there are no more speakers and we all go, we all go home from here. Thank you. Thank you for being with us and for your comment. It looks like we have read all the names on our speaker list. I do want to open it up in case anyone else would like to provide comment on this action. Sam, will you check me? Have we missed anybody? I think we have gotten to everyone that requested to speak. Oh, I just want to actually just want to follow up with our first speaker on the list again, Marianne Mulcahy. If you were having any technical issues or joined late, um, if if you would like to speak, uh, you can uh, jump in now. All right, well, given that, I think we've gotten to everyone who's interested in, to, in speaking, Allison. Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that a statement has been taken from all who wished to make one, and let the record reflect that the time is now 2.41 p.m., and this will conclude the public hearing for the proposed regulation titled COMAR 26.28, Building Energy Performance Standards, Thank you all to, who have joined us and a special thanks to everyone who's provided comment. Have a good afternoon.